Good morning. This is Professor Grenfell once again for Math 12 Statistics. We're continuing today in Chapter 1, and we're looking first at Chapter 1, Section 3 on data collection and sampling techniques. So there's many different ways that we can collect data. Um, just to name a few, we can uh, call people on the phone, telephone surveys. We can have people fill out a form on the Internet or send it to them in the mail and have them send it back. We can conduct personal interview surveys, um, either you know in person we can ask them questions or have them fill out a form and just hand it to us. And that way we can get a little bit richer content because you know we can engage them in discussion. Uh, other other methods of collecting data, we can go and, and look at records of information that's been collected already, or we can do direct observation and make our measurements ourselves. So there are lots of different ways of collecting the data, but for our purposes in our class so that we can focus on how to organize, summarize, analyze, and then, of course, inferential statistics, draw conclusions from the data, um, will basically just be given the all of all of the data from either the population or from our sample. They'll just say, here's the data and go with it. And so now let's let's discuss uh, different types of samples. So here are the basic types of samples that we're going to be considering. Random samples, systematic samples, stratified samples, and cluster samples. Um, we're we're going to look at a few other types, but for the most part, we're going to be assuming or we're going to be told that our data is a random sample. So let's see what that is about. A random sample is one in which all members of the population are equally likely to have an equal chance of being selected for this sample. Uh, the next one that we're discussing is a systematic sample. And in order to come up with a systematic sample, we are going to select every kth member where k is a counting number of the population. So here that's a little bit confusing. Some, you know, so here an example of this is we could say every hundredth customer that goes into this store, we're going to ask them whatever. And, you know, it doesn't always have to be 100, and so we're going to generalize and say k instead. How are these different? Well, in a random sample, we will essentially put them in some order and then come up with a, a random number generator and select all of those that are spit out by the random number generator. In a systematic sample, it seems like it's random, but it's slightly different. We'll put them in order, and then we'll do something like this, where we select every hundred person. Okay. Um, well, in a systematic sample, that underlying order that we put them in can be kind of an influencing factor. And so not every person or, or subject is equally likely to be selected. So it's not truly randomized if we're doing systematic sampling. And by the way, random sampling will be an underlying condition in a lot of these different techniques and methods that we're learning about. And so that is kind of the underlying assumption we'll be told here is a random sample of subjects of the population. So if possible, we would like to have a random sample. In a stratified sample, what we do is we divide the population into subgroups according to some characteristic. And then from there, we, we randomly select <clears throat> members of each uh, subgroup, and that forms our sample. And then finally, to form a cluster sample, we'll take the population, split it up into sections or clusters, and then select one or more of these clusters and use all of the subjects from 
these clusters that we've chosen as the sample. And so here is a quick example uh, to kind of compare and contrast all of these four different methods, random sampling, systematic sampling, stratified sampling, and cluster sampling. So, for example, our population might be all eligible voters in California. All right, to form a random sample, we'll just randomly pick uh, names off the entire voter roll. Okay, and that would be a random sample. A systematic sample, we would take that same roll sheet and select, let's say, for example, you know, just making this up, uh, every 1,000th name off the roll sheet. That would be a systematic sample because we're choosing a specific counting number and taking every one of that uh, from our population. A stratified sample, we might say, okay, we'll split the state up into, well, it's already kind of divided into counties, and we'll just go ahead and randomly select 150 voters from each county. All right, that would be stratified because we've broken it down into subgroups or strata and taken a select number at random from each of those. As opposed to a cluster sample, we'll just say, okay, it's already divided into counties. Those are our clusters. And we'll select everyone from Riverside County, Santa Barbara County, and Mono County. Just picked those at random and said everyone from each of these three counties, right? So there we have um, sampling methods. Now, since we are looking at a smaller subset of the population, a sample, and trying to make a generalization or a prediction from that information about the entire population, this next question is very important. Is the sample representative of the population? And that brings us to the discussion of types of errors. That is, if it is not representative of the population, well, how did that happen? The first thing to discuss is what we call a sampling error. And this is defined as the difference between results obtained from the sample and the results obtained from the population itself. Now, a uh, sample may be representative of the population. True, yeah, it's a good, good estimate for what's going on in the entire population, but it may not be exactly the same. The example that they give in the book says, Suppose you select a sample of full-time students at your college, and you find 56% are female. But then you go to the admissions office, and you get the entire list of all of the genders of all of the full-time students, so you can actually access the population, and you find that 54% are female. Well, in that case, the difference, 56% versus 54%, 2%, is, is the error due to the sample that you took. Another type of error that could occur is what we call a non-sampling error. Non-sampling error occurs when the data are obtained erroneously or the sample is biased. So, for example, you could be taking weights and the scale that you're using to measure those might be broken. So that would be you know, erroneous data. Or going back to that example about the gender of full-time students at your college, um, you might say, oh, okay, it's a convenient sample. I'll ask my friends or I'll just look at that as my sample. And that might be a, a biased sample if, if you have more female friends than you do male friends. Now, we don't have... Uh, Usually we don't have access to the information from the entire population, and so there's no way to know what the exact true sampling error is. But we have a way to get an estimate for it. Those techniques will be discussed in Chapter 7 in terms of confidence intervals. Um, but because non-sampling error can occur as well, we need to make sure that we are careful when we're selecting a sample 
to give us the data. In example 1-5, we're simply going to identify what sampling method was used. All right, so in part A, out of 10 hospitals in a municipality, a researcher selects one and collects records for a 24-hour period on the types of emergencies that were treated there. This is an example of cluster sampling. In part B, a researcher divides a group of students according to their gender, major field, uh, and low average or high grade point average. Then she randomly selects six students from each group to answer questions in a survey. What is this? If you were thinking stratified sampling, you would have been correct. In part C, it says the subscribers to a magazine are numbered. Then a sample of these people is selected using random numbers. All right, well, that's got to be random. And then in part D, every tenth bottle of energized soda is selected, and the amount of liquid in the bottle is measured. The purpose is to see if the machines that fill the bottles are working properly. Okay, so here we have a systematic sample. In this next section, 1-4 uh, on experimental design, we're going to first distinguish between types of statistical studies. The first type is what we call an observational study. In an observational study, the, the researcher merely observes what is happening or what has happened in the past. Observational studies can be further categorized into a couple of different headings, cross-sectional studies, retrospective studies, and longitudinal studies. When all of the data are collected at one single time, we refer to this as a cross-sectional study. A retrospective study is one in which all the data are from past records, so we're looking back at what happened. And a longitudinal study is one in which data are collected over a period of time, over a long period of time. The other type of study, research study, that we can uh, perform is what we call an experimental study. And in this situation, the researcher manipulates one variable and tries to determine how that influences another variable. So in an experimental study, there are two variables involved, the independent variable or the explanatory variable and the dependent variable, also called the outcome variable. The independent variable is the one that is being manipulated or controlled by the researcher. And the dependent, or also called the outcome variable, is the variable whose values are the result of the manipulation on the first variable. Another type of variable is one that we have to be extremely careful about. It is what we call a confounding variable, also referred to as a lurking variable. This is one that influences the outcome variable, the dependent variable, but wasn't separated from the independent variable. So in example 1-6 on experimental design, we're going to look at the following research scenario and then answer some questions regarding it. So it says researchers randomly assigned 10 people to each of three different groups. Group one was instructed to write an essay about the hassles in their lives. Group two was instructed to write an essay about circumstances that made them feel thankful. And then group three was asked to write an essay about events that they felt neutral about. After this exercise, they were given a questionnaire on their outlook on life. The researchers found that those who wrote about the circumstances that made them feel thankful had a more optimistic outlook on life. And the conclusion is that focusing on the positive makes you more optimistic about life in general. Based on this study, we're going to look at the following questions. A, was this an observational or experimental study? B, 
What is the independent variable? C. What is the dependent variable? D. What may be a confounding variable in this study? E. What can you say about the sample size? And F. Do you agree with the conclusion? Explain. Well, for part A, was this observational or experimental? I would say it is an experimental study. Why? Well, because there are two variables, namely the essay topic and then the outlook on life. In virtue of the fact that part B and C were asking us about the independent and dependent variables, we can obviously infer that this was experimental and not observational because observational studies don't involve two different variables. So what I had stated previously, the essay topic was the independent variable. Those were the ones that the researchers had control over. And part C, what is the dependent variable? That was the life outlook because that was what we were trying to determine if the first had an influence on. In part D, what may be a confounding variable in this study? Well, there may be many different things, the age of the subjects, their upbringing, their income levels, and so on and so forth, the list goes on. All of these different things might be influencing factors on their life outcome that is not really controlled for in terms of just the essay topic that they were instructed to write. Part E, what can you say about the sample size? Well, first of all, you can say what it is. The sample size is equal to 30. I put in here for the size of the sample. That's our common notation. Why is it 30? Well, we had three groups and there were 10 people that we put into each group. So we had a total of 30 people participating in this study. What can we say about it? Further than that, I would say we might be a little bit suspect about this because n is small, right? We can't just base our generalization on what's going on in the entire population on what 30 people do necessarily. It might be representative, but in general, we'd like to have larger samples. And part F, do you agree with this conclusion? Explain. Well, what do you think? Um, personally, I am inclined to believe this statement without evidence that focusing on the positive makes you uh, more optimistic about life in general. But for the stand from the standpoint of looking at just this study, I'm concerned that we only talk to 30 people, so the sample size might be small. There are many different confounding variables that we did not control for. So having, having someone write an essay about their, you know, about positive things or negative things or neutral things may not adequately give us the ability to say that focusing on positive influences your outlook in life in general. So, uh, you know, we can, we can kind of discuss this. This is an open-ended sort of question, right? What do you think? And now this is where I am going to conclude for chapter one, section three, and chapter one, section four. And in fact, uh, we're not going to look at what they covered from 1-5. I will be covering matters of technology uh, we'll be looking mainly at how to use Google Sheets in order to organize our data and do calculations with said data. Um, but I've kept it just under 20 minutes, so I'm going to sign off for this one. And I'll see you on the next video for Chapter 2.